But it's a great pleasure to be here uh, and take part in this uh, uh, celebration of Nick Holignac. Uh, I, I think, you know, like most people uh, that worked around him, I recognize his genius. He's the best scientist that I certainly ever worked with. Um, and it's, uh, it's amazing what he has done. I'm going to talk about the oxide and the oxide pixels. And, and last night we had a discussion. We were talking about discovery. And one of the things that uh, I think is the case uh, about Nick is the way he made his discoveries. And so I have some information in the slides about that to give you some background. And I'm going to talk about the oxide pixels a little bit. I think it's safe to say, uh, you, you know, we, we have some problems where we think, well, if somebody doesn't do it, somebody else is going to do it at some point in time. And with the oxide, I don't think that was true. And of course, if you didn't have the oxide, you wouldn't have the oxide pixel. And so sometimes people make that big of a difference that we don't know how the technology would have gone if it wasn't for Nick Holignac. And I think you'll see that uh, uh, as we go forward. So here's uh, an outline. I'm going to I'm going to give a brief background on the oxide mix. We'll talk about some of the ap applications, the markets, uh, kind of what's happening. And then I'll give a, uh, and I want to thank Milton and, and John for providing some of the slides. I've tried to keep their name uh, on which slides they provided uh, obvious so that we can tell that. But uh, Milton and Nick have some of the best speed results on oxide pixels. Now, it's the fastest laser that's out there because it's the smallest laser that's out there. Uh, and the speed is related to the size of the cavity. And then I want to go into the discovery of the oxide and um, how that came about to kind of to give a little information of how does this thing happen? How do, how, how do you go into the lab and you come out with something that is totally new and different and, and, and revolutionary and the oxide and the oxide pixel have, have done all of that? Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the physics, uh, if I can. Uh, how does it work? What makes the oxide pixel so special? What, what happened there? And then um, we're work I think a, a number of speakers have made the point that none of this is, and I used to remember Nick say, you can think it's finished, but it's not finished. And that's true with the pixels as well and what happens next. And so I'll, I'll say something about that. So this is one of John's slides. and it, it, it goes over some of the applications that are out there. This isn't all of them. Uh, Russ mentioned the, uh, uh, the iPhone dot projectors, basically 3D sensing and 3D sensing in a couple of different ways. But this gives you an idea of what some of them are. <clears throat> this, is this, gives you, uh, this is an old uh, market analysis. And if you're familiar with these, quite often they're done to sell the market analysis. So they're always uh, uh, overly optimistic, and these are probably off by about a factor of two for when it was done before 2018. But what it shows you is what these applications are. Data centers and optical fiber uh, transmission. In computer mice, basically the Vixel made, uh, enabled the compu computer my mouse, and all of these are oxide Vixels. This is all oxide Vixel technology. Uh, uh, tissue analysis, this uh, is overestimated in the market, but it's uh, uh, also a key application that's enabled by the oxide pixel. And then we have this thing, others, that at that time listed some other things. That wasn't the cell phone, which is going to swamp this. Um, and I'll give you some information about that. So what was such a big deal about the oxide pixel? Well, it was uh, created at a time where Proton implanted pixels existed, but proton implanted pixels had a speed problem. And they had a bit of a reliability problem, but a speed problem. Uh, they couldn't go faster. And when you're working with optical data uh, interconnects, the speed has become a real critical issue. And it's a constant push. And it doesn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. These are the smallest lasers, and they're the fastest. And if you look at a data center, uh, of course, these are all filled with, with racks of uh, what looks like microprocessors like this, and the dominant uh, laser in these data centers, uh, almost all of them, is the oxide pixel. Uh, now, there's other technologies in there, but the oxide pixel swamps the other, uh, the other lasers. And so you see we've talked a lot about 
things coming out of Illinois, and, and you see this impact of what happens in Illinois uh, when you see these kinds of things and you realize this little laser is, is, is a big part of it. So Milton and, uh, has actually some of the best results out there on high speed. The thing about the oxide vixel is you can make the cavity small. And we've studied speed on the vixel for quite some time. And you basically run out of steam on the speed um, because of the stimulated emission rate. There's some other parameters in there that seem like it can make a difference, but our analysis shows it's the stimulated emission rate. The harder you can drive the laser, the faster you can make it go. And the smaller you make the laser, the harder you can drive the laser. So there's a reason why that's, that's the fastest. This is some of uh, uh, Milton's results. He's, I think this is, uh, um, this is a record speed here, almost up to 60 gigabits per second. Uh, you can do different uh, techniques to, to uh, make it go faster yet, but uh, incredible speeds. And, and this is some of his results. This is a, a, an oxide pixel and some of the characteristics. Um, these are some more. I'm going to go through some of these slides fairly quickly because I have a number of the slides, but I, I, I want to uh, take more time on some. Uh, and so some more from uh, Milton showing how you can I still got it. Okay. Uh, showing how you can go to longer distances by going to single mode vixels. These are all oxide. Uh, some more uh, results on uh, uh, different features of high speed oxide vixels. This is something that we're working on with Milton. It actually is a uh, oxide vixels are a stepping stone for what we're doing now. The physics of the oxide vixel showed us how to do other things. And that's. Uh, something that uh, comes out of this as well. This is the sensor market, and you can see what happens when, it, when the pixels go into a cell phone that, that Russ was talking about. Uh, these, are, these are much closer to being accurate, uh, and the projection, projection is that it's going to be, uh, well, here, just the sensor pixels alone are projected to be a billion dollars uh, by 2020. That's probably not too far off. Uh, the, Oxide pixels went from a market size of, I would say, probably zero or um, approximately zero in 2016, 2017 to something like 150 million uh, in 2017. And so it's got that right trajectory. Well, I actually, I think, the, and, and this is the uh, cell phone. There's other ty ty types of sensors in there. Uh, so the Vixel is headed towards being coming one of the dominant not only semiconductor lasers, but laser, laser markets out there. And semiconductor lasers are already becoming big in the market. This is another slide from John that shows kind of the history of the laser, or of the pixel and the oxide pixel. And there's a couple places in here where you see, well, here's one of Nick's students, Greg Stillman, where they were already doing optically pumped uh, surface emitting lasers. Now, Kenichi Iga from Japan is a real pioneer that brought us to uh, what it was the practical pixel pretty close. Uh, there were some breakthroughs from Bell Labs as well. But um, here you see uh, Don Cyphers and, and Robert Burnham uh, uh, with uh, surface emitting lasers, uh, two more students. Uh, Here's where John and Nick uh, demonstrated the oxide, and this is really based on experiments that Nick was doing for years before uh, the native oxide was essentially discovered. Uh, this is our work from Texas in 93, uh, 94, demonstrating the first oxide pixel. So how did this start? And this is the part where the discovery becomes important it's kind of hard to imagine that this, which is a crystal falling apart, is going to lead to a technology that dominates data centers, cell phones, and may dominate all of the semiconductor lasers. And so when I was in, Nick, in Nick's lab, Nick was already studying this, and he'd been studying it for years. And of course, Nick always has very good stories to tell. And he knew how important the oxide was on silicon, which he told that story many times of how that happened. And he also emphasized over and over again how important it would be to have a 3,5 oxide. 
And the problems were they weren't stable. And you can see that they weren't stable. They're falling apart, which is one of the reasons why he was, uh, why he was following it. He must have been studying this for, well, probably five to 10 years when he talked to me about it in 86 and 87. And here's the surface degrading. Now, gallium arsenide is stable, but our gas becomes less stable, and the more aluminum you put into it, the less stable it becomes. This is uh, some critical experiments that were done uh, really by John when uh, Nick put him to work on this, and, th and this is uh, probably the first uh, native oxide, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but the first native oxide that was demonstrated, and still, you can't quite see what was going on. And it's, uh, I'll show you, uh, you know, a lot of things happen by accident, but, you have, but the thing about uh, uh, Nick was he didn't miss what was important when that went on. So he, he already knew this was an important problem, and he knew why it was an important problem. So what's happening here is we're getting a little bit of oxidation where the crystal isn't exactly falling apart. It's, it's remaining stable. And that was enough for them, for them to see that, yes, this, this is a different kind of an oxide that has been formed before. So this wasn't intended to be done. What happened was uh, uh, John uh, increased the oxidation rate by going into a steam furnace and, and, and going up to the right temperatures and went uh, past the phase transition where it formed a stable oxide. This is another picture of this oxide uh, that came out of Nick's lab. Uh, and I think this is the first publication uh, of the oxide. So this was back in 1990. And Nick was already working on edge emitters. Uh, and this is an example of some edge emitter work that they were doing. This is, this is another long going, uh, long uh, term experiment. This is an aluminum arsenide surface that hasn't, or it might be algas, that hasn't been oxidized. And this is the native oxide. And I think this is, uh, it's, yeah, here's the time. So this, this has been uh, looked at from 1991 to 2012 and it's, it's just a very durable oxide. So here's the timeline of the oxide Vixel, and I was, uh, so Nick and John uh, made this discovery based on the experiments that Nick was doing. I, uh, and in uh, 1990, uh, probably 91, um, uh, I started working with uh, Nick and trying to do mirrors out of the oxide. We weren't successful at it. Um, and here's really the first patent on an oxide vixel in 1993, but it, it's not an oxide apertured vixel. And an oxide apertured vixel is very different than just putting oxide into the vixel. And so uh, uh, it's not that it's not an important patent, but the technology isn't what, what is used. This is where we discovered uh, uh, a mechanism, a cavity mechanism that gave rise to the oxide vixel. Uh, and basically that was reported in, in 94. So what led to the oxide vixel in my lab was that we were doing epitaxial regrowth and we were doing um, etching to do that regrowth in. And at one point, another, another uh, accident, the crystal was over etched. So when you look through the microscope, this is what we saw. This is where we were etching a thin film, but we had a thin film of algas gas on top of that or below that, and uh, gallium arsenide on top to do the regrowth, and we were going to regrow so that in this region would be the active region of the vixel, and we would get current confinement. We, uh, the vixels weren't understood very well at that point. What we did was we overestimated, it, and uh, when we looked at it under the microscope, you know, one of the students showed it to me, and he said, hey, I overestimated. it. Should I go ahead and, what, should, I, should I discard it, or should I go ahead and, what should I do with it? And I said, go ahead and grow on it. Let's see what happens. So what you're seeing here is, is transmission through a thin film, and it's square because it was etching out gas and it was crystallographic. So we did that, and when we made the Vixels, they had a very remarkable property. So this is not oxide yet, but, it ha but what we did was we created those etched voids buried within the crystal. And when we measured the Vixels, the vi uh, some of the Vixels didn't work, and some of the vixels had unbelievably low threshold. 
In fact, we had some that were less than 20 microamps, but the thresholds were so low, I wasn't quite sure whether I could believe it, and I didn't think other people were, would believe it, and they weren't very reliable, so we drove them until they failed a little bit, and then we published that data. It's like, well, they will believe that. Uh, so it would be easier to publish, and so that's what we did. Well, I realized this was doing something. We've been making Victuals for quite some time, uh, and so, and, and I had already seen how good the oxide was because I had gone to Nick's lab and Nick had explained it to me, basically. So I, I thought, well, maybe the oxide will do the same thing, not quite knowing why. And it did, and it did it in a quite amazing fashion. So this is the first publication on the oxide pixel. It's an oxide aperture. I'm not showing the top mirror here, but it has an oxide aperture buried under a conducting layer, kind of like the other one. And this is an SEM, and you can see where the oxide is because it's insulating uh, in this region where the oxide is, and it's not insulating here, it's conducting, and you can see where, it, again, it formed a square aperture because it was crystallographic. And we had, again, remarkably low thresholds. And this one then started to create quite a stir when we uh, uh, presented it. Now, the, the reason why the oxide pixel works as well as it does, and, and to, as, as I said, it's, it has an advantage in making small lasers, and you need to have a small optical mode that you can make with, small, with very low optical loss, uh, or it's not going to work well. That's, that's the problem with what the earlier technology. But when you look at the structure, these are near fields, and when you look at these structures, even barely above threshold, you can see how much structure was in that mode. And you can't get that without very low optical loss in this very small, in this very small aperture. So we knew that there was something else going on. And we eventually figured it out, and other people figured it out. And so I, that, that mechanism was also a discovery. That's a, that's a new mechanism in confining the optical mode. And it came there uh, partly because of what we did on the S void, but really because of how well the oxide worked so we could figure out why it was working. And I can do an analogy because probably there's people in the room that are uh, more familiar with quantum wells. And so if you have a quantum well, an outgas gallium arsenide quantum well, you have a confined mode uh, where the k-vector has to, and, and perpendicular to the quantum well, has to satisfy the boundary conditions. And this sets the lowest energy state that that quantum well can have. And of course, the, so then the thickness of the quantum well sets the energy confinement. Well, the same thing happens but with a different dispersion relation in an optical cavity where you have reflectors and they create a boundary condition where you have to satisfy this k-vector in the vertical direction if you have high enough reflectivity. And the thing about these pixels is they had very high reflectivity and very short cavities. So if you have a bulk region, uh, your different eigenstates become so closely spaced in energy that it, it, it looks continuous. It's not really Ever, con ever continuous, you have dephasing uh, effects, uh, temperature that also makes it look continuous despite the fact that from uh, a typical quantum mechanical analysis it, it, it isn't. Um, same thing here, to trap one mode takes a short cavity. And so if you, what we know is that if you vary that thickness of the quantum well, then uh, you get the same kind of quantum size effect here, but at a higher energy. And because you have a thicker well in one region, uh, it has a lower energy. And what happens is that the region of the higher energy confines the region of the lower, that, that allows the lower energy state to exist, so you get a bound state in this region. Well, that's what we did in the 3D cavity, but from an optical perspective. We created a bound mode uh, in the optical cavity with a very thin aperture. And there's two ways that you can create this 3D confined optical mode. You can actually use a physical change in the length of the cavity. And what that does is that shifts um, the lowest frequency for modes propagating out to a higher frequency. And when to satisfy the boundary conditions, when that mode overlaps uh, from one region to the next region, of course, the frequency has to remain constant, and it's made up by an evanescent k vector along the plane, and that describes what the confinement is. Well, oxide was doing the same thing. And when you look at the oxide, it's too thin 
to get the kind of confinement if you just say, well, it's an index change. And now we know it's not the index change, it's the fact that you shift the resonance. So I'll show you what this oxide looks like. This is also from a high-speed transceiver. This is a silicon driver to drive the Vixels. Now there's a whole industry of the, of the driver chips to drive these Vixels. This is a Vixel array. So this is a four-channel array. These are relatively slow. Uh, but here's the aperture of the Vixel. And if you slice this apart, you can see right in here this very thin oxide aperture and you can see the cavity with the distributed Bragg reflectors and how thick it is. And that's how that thin oxide aperture is so effective in confining the optical mode. Let's see. So uh, I'm almost at the end and uh, I will uh, uh, make one step in the transition from the oxide pixel to actually doing this as well because we had already known from the oxide that you don't just need the oxide, or it's not just, just the oxide, a resonance shift will give you that optical confinement. And so if we look at uh, how, how we're doing the Vixels now, we have replaced that oxide with a true internal step inside the, inside the crystal to confine the light. And part of the reason is to make the optical mode even smaller yet. Uh, but also, it lets us drive it to higher current densities to get the uh, greater stimulated emission rates. These are uh, LIs from uh, this type of a pixel. And uh, if you're not used to looking at these kinds of devices, this is almost 20 milliwatts from a six micron aperture and the kind of current density that you can drive these things to is amazing. By the time you get down to a one micron aperture, it's going up to two or 300 kiloamps per square centimeter. These things are gonna be capable of, of, of probably mega amps per square centimeter as they get smaller. And what's the significance of that? Well, eventually your stimulated emission rate becomes so high that you basically start to decouple the inside of the laser from the environment because your recombination rate through your transitions is faster than the electrons can relax into the transitions. So it basically starts to isolate itself. Now what happens when, that, when we get into that regime where we've never been uh, is gonna be some interesting physics. It may go into some type of new Rabi oscillator or, 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 or something of that sort. Uh, but it, it all comes from making the laser smaller. How small can we make it? Well, these are uh, actual experimental results that I did with Ken Shi at, at Texas when I was there, uh, showing that we can reduce that mode all the way down to uh, 100 nanometers in diameter for one micron wavelength. Um, and what happens is you're, uh, you're able to drive it to higher current density because the amount of current you're putting in is less and so the amount of heating you have is less, and it's the thermal rollover that really limits these things. So with these kinds of technologies, uh, one of the reasons why we're working on this, which is the next step from an oxide, is because uh, we can get very high packing density in the pixels. This is, a, this is two micron diameter pixels on three micron center to center spacings, and you can see what happens to the spectrum. This is a large, ap large aperture. This has got six micron diameter pixels, four micron diameter pixels, and by the time you get to two micron diameter, they're all single mode. For dot projectors, that packing density is quite important. Uh, and I, I ju I'll just say something about automotive LiDAR, because we're talking about these markets where the pixels, and, and, and the pixel markets are totally dominated by oxide, and they're gonna be dominated by oxide for years to come. So I don't know if Illinois is still earning royalties. I, I, I guess at this point they're not, but there's, there's uh, uh, big markets out there. This is a self, these are, self, of course, self-driving cars. This is a Velodyne LiDAR system, and they have, these things have a number of sensors on it, but what they're generating is a 3D point cloud, uh, uh, 2Ds in space with, with, a distance, with, with a distance measurement, and it's got a, li a rotating LiDAR system. Here's got four rotating LiDAR systems. So how does the Vixel replace that? Well, basically, it's you, you make it individually addressable, and if you look at a Vixel array, this is what a Vixel array projects. And if you can turn those on one at a time, you can scan the beam, and you can basically generate the 3D point cloud. And so Vixels are one of the candidates uh, to, to, to go into automotive LiDAR and self-driving. And I, uh, from everything that I understand uh, about automotive LiDAR, uh, 
there's not a technology that satisfies what's needed. We have these rotating mirror systems that show that the self-driving is possible and that work reasonably well, but they're too expensive. And so it needs a low-cost semiconductor solution for that. And these are the types of arrays that we're working on, big arrays with big elements to get to the powers. This is how, th these are the sensors that are on a self-driving vehicle. There's a number of them, and you, you may have heard some stories about accidents. Uh, sometimes uh, people have left off the LiDAR system and uh, it's caused problems. So the, the, the thinking that you can get rid of any of these sensors doesn't appear to be possible. It's a complicated system, but of course self-driving is, is, is a big market. If the Vixel went into this technology, it would swamp the cell phone market because the number of Vixels, uh, Vixel array chips that are required on each automobile is so high. This is the problem with using this rotating mirror system. This was the one that had four of the lasers on it. This was some time ago. These, these were $8,000, so you got $32,000 of LiDAR on your automo automobile, so obviously that's a problem. Uh, as you go to higher numbers of lasers, your accuracy increases, which is what's needed. So they're using either, uh, the demonstrations were either four of those or the, the single one with the 64 uh, laser. These prices may have come down, but that's not gonna work uh, for most of the self-driving that people are looking for. Oh, I lost my, I lost my slide. Well, I think I can show you on this. So this is 256 pixels, and the resolution is limited by the number of lasers that you have in, in these LiDAR systems. So you can see this is 256 lasers on a very small chip uh, versus 64 lasers in one of these big rotating systems, and the, the, the 256 lasers have electronic scanning. So big advantage. So it's not clear how this is going to turn out in terms of self-driving, but this is one of the candidates. That's my last uh, slide. Thank you. Uh, very much.